right. Um, so we'll now uh, get started. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining our uh, second talk of this month's uh, festival month of <laughs> Uh Today is a talk given by the guest speaker, Dr. Andrew Hong. Andrew uh, visited uh, my lab back in 2016 or 15, I guess. 14. 14, oh yeah. <laughs> and then there we started working on the empirical testing of the integrated information theory. At that time it was a uh, 2.0 version uh, applied onto uh, University of Iowa data set um, recorded from awake patients on uh, visible and invisible stimuli. And he published that paper in 2017. And uh, after very short uh, six months of the visiting uh, us as a uh, federal uh, scholarship uh, postdoc, he went to um, Julia Tononi's lab to do a postdoc. And he has been working on uh, very fundamental work on the visual space uh, over there and published a very nice paper uh, uh, what is space in uh, uh, last year in entropy? Uh, I I think we already sent you the link to that. And he also recently uh, published uh, uh, or uploaded a paper uh, on the vis uh, what is visible across the visual field. That's mostly psychophysics and uh, uh, computational modeling, and that's what he's going to talk today uh, in the ha uh, first half of the uh, talk. So. Uh, without much uh, other stuff, but I, I just wanted to give you some administrative uh, uh, request. <laughs> One is that, uh, so uh, today's talk will be uh, aimed to be uh, more interactive than usual passive lecture. So if you have any question, uh, please use the chat box on the uh, Zoom uh, function and then ask any uh, short and uh, quick clarification type questions throughout the talk. Yes, and uh, I'll be monitoring the chat uh, box uh, while Andrew is focusing on his own talk. And uh, as I see if it's appropriate, then I'll you know ask question uh, to Andrew on behalf of you, or I'll ask you to elaborate on the question to Andrew during the talk. And the uh, question during the talk will be recorded uh, as of uh, now. And eventually, it's going to be uh, probably posted to a YouTube video. Um, and also, it will be used as a part of the requirement for the next couple of uh, talks. Uh, Shun Sasai's talk next year, uh, next week, and Jiro Tononi's talk afterwards, uh, week after. So uh, uh, if you have a more elaborated uh, discussion type questions, then please do ask it uh, afterwards, uh, after the talk. And that's part of the question and answer will not be recorded. Or well, at least we record, but we will not post it onto the YouTube. And so it's gonna be quite informal. Um, and Andrew will be available one hour, two hour after the talk. <laughs> I'll try. Yeah, I'll do my best. <laughs> yeah. So, and he'll be happy to uh, answer and discuss any complicated questions. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, our uh, the, the plan is uh, to have a first talk a part on uh, psych physics and the model in the initial 20 to 30, maybe up to 45 minutes. And then the second part, again, 20 to 45 minutes, including question and uh, uh, answer. So yeah. if you have a relatively you know, long question, that's still okay if it's, it relates to only first part, because first part and second part tend to be slightly disjoint right yeah yeah okay uh let's go thank you andrew go ahead okay yeah um so um the title the the two parts of the title here are referring to the two parts of the talk so the what's visible across the visual field is referring to how we're going to evaluate things about visual quality and so on um the the subtitle that's when we get to the iit stuff um, try to explain just what this what this thing is. What is the visual field in the first place? Um, all right, and that so this is referring to these two papers. Um, so 
this is all, most of what I'm showing here is pretty superficial. I'm not gonna go through any kind of computation of anything. Um, I'm just gonna kind of present things as they are. So all the details are in these papers. Um, so this is a cartoon I like to show people of, I guess my idea of the structure of visual experience. Um, I think the stuff that we usually think about when we think about visual experiences this, this higher level stuff, you know, recognitional properties, um, the stuff that you extract from, um, from early vision. That's the stuff we really care about. Um, that's what really matters to you when it comes to vision. But I, th I think all of us, you know, I assume everyone here who is having a visual experience now, um, and we always have this thing at the bottom. This is the visual field. This is a, a very kind of stable, highly structured spatial experience. I think it's the very base of, uh, of all visual experience. And this is the thing that we're gonna talk about today. So I'm not gonna talk any more about these high level things, um, recognition, but I think this is a Gibson term, world of inferences. Um, no, we're gonna talk about this spatial thing at the bottom, right? So what is it like? What is the visual field like? Um, this, this is something that people, I don't think it's usually put this way, um, but this is something that there's a lot of debate about, and I think a lot of misconceptions, um, because uh, a lot of uh, prominent philosophers, even cognitive science people, um, psychologists, have this idea that the visual field isn't like what it seems to be like. Um, you see this show up in all kinds of different ways, but they're always usually kind of talking about the same thing. Um, so Dennett has been saying this for 30 years, or longer that that if you have the idea that um, your visual experience is is clear and colorful across its full extent then you're subject to a false belief because visual experience can't be this way across the full extent of the visual field um schwitz Geibel would say that you're um you're mistaken um if you think that you experience colors and textures sharply defined across the visual field um and uh, Hakuan Lao would say that uh, it's a failure of metacognition. We need to explain why you would say such things, because clearly you can't actually be having such experiences. Um, the reason, I mean, people have reason to say these things, um, you know, starting from sort of basic facts of physiology. You know, it's true that in the, fo in the, in the retina, um, the photoreceptors that you use for most of your visual experiences, um, are more tightly packed near the fovea, and then they get more and more widely spaced as you get further and further away from the fovea. That's what the lower panels here are showing. And the, what, what's interspersed there are the rods that are basically insensitive um, during um, in most light conditions that, that um, we're familiar with. Um, and uh, what drops even more rapidly with eccentricity is the ganglion cell density. And that's what actually matches with your psychophysical performance better. So it is true that, um, you have this coarser and coarser um, sampling of information out into the periphery. Um, and following from this, it's true that uh, your perceptual abilities are coarser in the periphery. So um, your, uh, well, I, these lower plots here are acuity plots, right? So your achromatic acuity, like the finest target that you can see, is larger and larger as you go further out into the periphery. Your chromatic acuity is even worse. So your acuity for color targets is even worse, right? They have to be even bigger for you to see them. Um, and the dependence on eccentricity is even stronger for color targets. You can break this down in more detail. Um, and these patterns show up very clearly for contrast sensitivity. So each of these lines is um, uh, contrast sensitivity for a target of fi fixed spatial frequency. Um, you translate that out into the periphery and your sensitivity drops. Right? So you need a higher contrast just to see the thing. Um, and that drop is steeper and steeper, the smaller the target is. So the higher the spatial frequency, the more drastic the drop in sensitivity is. And over on the right, we have the same kind of data for some uh, red-green contrast. And so um, here, you can't really compare them well by eye, but the drops here are even steeper. For the same spatial frequency, you're much worse off for your red-green contrast sensitivity. I mean, the, de the dependence on eccentricity is much stronger for red-green than it is for achromatic. Um, and it's also worse for the blue-yellow channels. Um, but I mean, there's a disconnect here because we haven't really addressed 
what, what do these declines in psychophysical performance mean for visual qualities, like for what you actually experience? Because that's what all of these, these guys are, are concerned with. Um, they're all concerned not with perform, some of them might identify to some extent, you know, psychophysical performance with perception or perceptual experience. Um, but they're all concerned with experience. That's what they're talking about. So what can we say about what you can experience based on these kinds of psychophysical data? So if we can put it this way, if, if performance declines with eccentricity, is it true that qualities must decline? And, and yeah, what I'm gonna show is that no, it's not true, that, that these are actually different things. Uh, there's, there's, as I see it, there's kind of two, um, two questions we have to ask. Um, uh, to, to get at this. One is what is the relationship between psychophysical sensitivity and visual qualities? Um, the, the answer to that, I think, is just that, you know, uh, the psychophysical sensitivity is telling you whether or not you have an experience of some, you know, evoked by a stimulus, it's like a psychometric function kind of thing. Um, the other question is what are the relevant qualities for these naive beliefs about colorfulness and sharpness and normal visual experiences. This is kind of a more difficult thing to, to address, but I'm gonna present some ideas here. Um, but for both of these, we need a model, right? So, um, because clearly you can't just ask a person what kind of experience you're having, you know, because then we can question their introspection. You need some, some kind of statistical analysis of what they say. Um, so the way I'm gonna approach this is by building a model of spatial vision. Um, and I call this a standard model because these are all probably the way I've put it together is kind of novel, but all of these parts um, go back a long time. And I've just kind of put them together in a particular way to address a very large body of, of uh, evidence. Um, so the way this model is put together is you have a, a field, a visual field. Um, and this is tiled with uh, uh, contrast filters, the filters get larger and larger at larger eccentricities. Um, on average, they get larger. Um, they tile the entire visual field. Um, each filter is actually uh, an array of, uh, of linear filters at various orientations and scales um, and different color contrasts. Hello, how are you? Yeah, I have two preschoolers wandering around here. So, um, and so this is actually what you have at every point in the visual field, um, or this is what you need to explain psychophysical performance at every point in the visual field. You need filters that all these different color contrasts or sensitive to different color contrasts and different orientations and scales. So what I use in this model is this lab CIE representation of color. That's not what usually would be used for like generating stimuli for like a color psychophysics experiment, you'd use code and contrast or something. This is close enough, you know, it's an approximation. So the linear response of these filters is passed through a saturating nonlinearity like this. So every filter is passed through a nonlinearity like this with parameters that are adjusted to fit the data. Um, and what this nonlinearity is doing is it's converting that contrast, the contrast of the physical stimulus into a signal noise ratio. Now, um, and so now every one of these filters, there's a large number of filters you can imagine tiling this field. Every one of them is now attached to a signal noise ratio that can potentially be used to do some psychophysics task. Um, so to give you an idea of how you simulate um, such a task with a, uh, a real stimulus, I have my little guide here to show you like how big this target is. This is a 3.2 cycle per degree grading. Um, we would expose this to the model. And what you get out is a, a, a spatial array of signal noise ratios um, that I, here I've collapsed it across orientation and color channels and so on. So at every point here, there's a vector of, of responses. Um, and if you want to know well, how, how well would this observer do at detecting this stimulus, you just read the peak off of this response. So the best signal noise ratio is the sensitivity of the model observer for this target. All right, so there's no area of summation or uncertainty, right? So again, this is an approximation. Um, and to show you that this does basically what it should do, um, we can take this target um, and translate it out uh, as far as uh, 25 degrees. Um, and you see that at some point, the response is lost. So you get this 3.2 cycle per degree grading, 10% contrast. Foveally, it's perfectly visible, 
right? So the D primes here are getting up well above six. So an observer in an experiment would get would detect this grading correctly on every trial and more than a thousand trials, right? Um, when you get out to 20, deg 20 degrees eccentricity, they're going to start making mistakes, right? These are measurable D primes, like three or so. Um, 25 degrees, now the target has basically disappeared. You know, there might be something, you might be slightly above chance for this stimulus at 25 degrees eccentricity. All right, so this is that, this is that loss of sensitivity for a fixed spatial frequency that we saw earlier. Um, and we can reproduce those kinds of data very, very well, all right? So you can vary the parameters in lots of different ways. Um, and if you put the model together the right way, um, you get fits like this that I think are pretty good. So the leftmost column is contrast sensitivity for achromatic targets. Um, each panel is a different spatial frequency. The x-axis is eccentricity. The next column is um, the model's performance on similar targets. Um, and the lines are the same in the two. So you can see that it's the, the model data versus the human data are very similar. Um, the next two columns are the same thing for um, uh, red-green stimuli, right? So human data, model data, very similar. Uh, uh, Andrew, yeah. just for clarification, the first and third column is the data from each of the respective papers, right? Yeah, this is the first column and the third column. Those are data from, from the papers that are yeah. listed. And the one. model is uh, so one single model that you have without any fitting uh, that's already producing this data. Yeah, well, it's fit. I mean, the fitting is one thing. So you do, there's, there's kind of like this, this frame in there, a set of contrast sensitivity functions um, that are fit to a set of this data. Um, but then that's fixed, right? So you okay. fix that and then you can expose it to the stimuli and do these, these tests. And it actually generalizes pretty, once you once you fix it on enough points, enough eccentricities, enough frequencies, for different color channels, then it does pretty well at predicting what things are going to do on on uh, conditions that you haven't actually fitted for. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's it's. I I don't, I don't remember how many parameters there are. Um, there's maybe five parameters that are fit that I you know um, that I went through some routine to fit those parameters, and the other three or four. There's four parameters for the for that nonlinearity that are basically fixed. One of them is dependent on the contrast sensitivity function. So there is fitting that goes on here. Um, all right, so then once you have all that contrast sensitivity data, you can estimate the model acuity. And again, the lines are the same um, on the left and the right. So the, the model acuity and the human acuity for targets, basically the same, right? So the, the, the detail that this model sees that it's sensitive to the contrast that it's sensitive to, um, and the resolution with which it sees that stuff is, is basically the same as a typical human observer, or at least the kinds of human observers that have done these experiments. Yeah. So I'd say this is, a, this is a good model of how image contrast is represented in human vision. Um, it's a pretty good model. Um, and it's, it's kind of embodying all of those data that I think that the that the people that I cited at the beginning are basing their ideas on. You know, the idea that, well, you have this drop in sensitivity with eccentricity. Um, you must not be able to see very well out there. Um, you must not be able to represent color or detail and so on. Well, this model does the same thing, right? So if you looked at, at the data pre presented, uh, produced by this model, you might have the same kind of guess about what, um, what kind of information it can represent. So then, we're going to try to test this question of, well, what, what do we see in sort of normal experience? Um, we're going to take this model and expose it to lots of big, colorful, high resolution natural scenes. So these are all the kinds of scenes that you might, you know, look out on and kind of marvel at and say, ah, oh, well, I'm having this big, um, detailed, clear, colorful experience across my visual field. Um, so what we're going to look at here is, are you actually justified based on your, your visual capacities in believing such a thing? Or, or is it, must it be an illusion? You, know, um, you can guess at what the answer is going to be. So I'll just go through this again here. So the response to a natural scene is going to look very similar as it did to that grading, except it's much more complex, right? So um, all of these uh, model image uh, uh, 
scene perception images that I'm going to show are like this, where the fovea is over on the left, um, the far left side. Um, and as you go from left to right, you're going larger and larger eccentricities. These all go out to about 30, 30 something degrees eccentricity. So this, this response image on the right, again, this is collapsed across different um, filter parameters. Look at how high those D primes get, all right? So this is the, the first thing, like 20, 25, you could, you know, you can't, it's hard to measure a D prime of five in a detection experiment. The way we know that you actually do have D primes like that, you do a um, threshold versus contrast experiment, you use something like Fechner's method and you can integrate and, you know, so we know that it, it is reasonable to suppose that you have signal noise ratios like this, um, but they have to be um, measured indirectly. But the first thing you learn from this is that contrast response is really high across the visual field, across the model visual field, and I think probably also again across the human visual field. Um, Andrew, yeah. just a quick question. So when you say the D prime around zero, around this, you know, uh, blue sky area, yeah, mm -hmm. what does it mean? Oh, I, are you putting some kind of a Gabor patch like thing at ten percent or something like that on top of this scene and then measuring the D prime? Or what, what's a D prime around this, you know, blue area to be zero? Yeah, that. Uh, um, okay, so there are limits in how the model is put together. So it's uh, all of the filters are bandpass, right? So there's no DC to any of the filters. Um, whereas in normal vision, you actually have some, and that means that they're not sensitive to the local mean luminance, mm -hmm. right? And so none of that information actually gets captured in this model. It does in some ways for the sake of what I'm going to show in a few slides, um, but it, it's, uh, for uh, for the part of the model simulating sensitivity, it's not capturing the, the mean luminance. And so, if you have a big blank area like this, then those there's no filters that will respond to that. So, um, in, in other words, is it like uh, compared to the complete blank gray screen, how much a difference uh, this image uh, makes in terms of response at that area? And the blue uh, uniform area doesn't make huge response around that area. Is that what you're saying, Lawrence? Yeah, there's not, there's not a filter. If I had a filter big enough, and that's, one of, that's what I'm saying about limitations. You know, you could have a filter that has a, a blue on region as big as this part of the sky. I don't know if you can tell that I'm circling it here. Uh-huh, we can. Um, right, and where the yellow, um, um, the yellow on regions are down here and up here, um, it's kind of like a double opponent receptive field, the way the filters work, then you would get a response there. But at some point, the model, the, the filters get big enough that I, I clip them out and I don't include them in the model. It's just for like efficiency's sake. I see. Um, okay. So one answer was that, that there was some uh, a limitation in the size uh, scale that you modeled. And But uh, there was a couple of questions. Uh, one was uh, basically the same thing as I asked. What, what is a kind of task or response that this model is trying to do? So, well, my take was that you are trying to discriminate between the blank image versus this image at each point. Is it correct? No, 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 no. No? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, so, the, the model is set up to reproduce these. Th these are the behavioral data, right? So, this is like what the experiment is like. Yeah. All right. So, if you wanted to simulate an experiment, then I would show this, the model a grading. Um, and I would adjust the contrast of the grading until I get a D prime that is whatever a human would do, right? That's not how I'm doing it, right? But so here, that's, that's the right way to interpret this is the, the D prime at this spot right here is basically, that's what would determine an observer's hit rate and false alarm rate for this stimulus at that eccentricity, yeah? But, what you're doing when you do these experiments and you're measuring all of these parameters for contrast sensitivity and contrast discrimination and so on, is I think you're measuring the, the structure of contrast transduction in the early visual system, right? That's the thing that has that sensitivity, right? You have all these mechanisms that are picking up contrast and sending some kind of signal downstream, yeah? So that's what the experiments reveal that structure. But then once you have that model, you're free to just expose it to complex scenes like this. And yeah, there's no task. So here I have a big array of these signal noise ratios, but 
I mean, this image as a whole is like perfectly visible, right? It's like, it's, it's silly to talk about this thing as a, as a stimulus and a detection experiment. Yeah, okay, uh, maybe we can uh, skip and then uh, come back to this issue if there is further yeah. question. But uh, also, do you want to say something about uh, what, how, what do you do with the edge at the edge yeah. of the image? Yeah, you can see that it just wraps around, right? So if the filter is up here, because this is, it's symmetric from, you know, I have the, the horizontal meridian is running through the very center of the screen. So, so yeah, it's as though the same image is stacked on top of itself vertically. Yeah, and from left to right. That's the actual okay. state of the model, because I'm using Fourier transforms and so on to do this, so. Okay. Um, it's, it's not so pretty, but it's fine. Um, yeah, so I mean, this, the response is made up of signal noise ratios, and you can think of them as D primes, which you associate with doing exper detection experiments and discrimination experiments and so on. But it's, but it's also just a value that's attached to the response of these filters, and they're responding whether or not you're doing a task. If you're just looking at normal, visual stimuli, those same filters that do a task, they're responding to a natural scene, right? So this is the table of those responses. Um, so just routinely, those filters are responding at levels that is like way beyond what you measure in a psychophysics experiment. So your contrast filters are just routinely responding with signal noise ratios that are basically perfect, you know, 10, 15, 20, I think is normal. The, the, one reason for this is the natural scene contrasts are really strong, right? So a typical natural scene that you expose yourself to, you know, in normal life, it's not composed of contrasts that are near your detection thresholds. It's composed of contrasts that are way, way beyond your detection thresholds. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, so what we're trying to get to here is you know, how can we estimate what kind of color information is there in this, in this thing, right? So if this is the, what an observer gets from a scene, how much color information is there out here on the periphery? Um, would they be justified in saying that the periphery is as colorful as the phobia, for example? Um, there's several ways to do this. The way I like to do it is by reconstructing um, a visible image. So what you do is for every one of those filters, you take its response, which again is a, is a D prime value or a signal noise ratio, and convert it to the statistic called the accuracy, right? So this is basically, you're gonna take D prime and turn it back into a hit rate and back into a false alarm rate. And I do it for the optimal criterion here. Um, we can talk about criterion later. Um, it doesn't have a big impact on this. Um, so that way you've rescaled D prime from zero to one. Um, and we're gonna take that value and apply it to the cosine phase of the contrast that's being detected by each of those filters. Yeah. Um, and long story short, what that gives you is a reconstruction of the original image, but it's only composed of contrasts that are, that are eliciting very high signal noise ratios in the, in the model, right? So this, I call this the visible image. This is, this is what the model can see very clearly, right? Um, and, and kind of by extension, this is what I think a human observer can see very clearly. You know, of course, there's approximations going on here. Um, so, I mean, this is a nicer, I like this example um, of it because this actually can kind of confirm some of the misconceptions, which is neat. Um, so at the top, we have our stimulus image. The phobia is here on the far left. Um, you can see the response image. There's big responses across the whole field. Um, but then compare the golden uh, cupolas at the left and at the right, right? So near the phobia, the observer can see that golden color on the roof of the church here. But at the far right, this one has disappeared, right? So this feature is now invisible. You can see something, but it's colorless. Yeah. So you might see this and think, ah, yeah, it's, it's actually true that the color representation is declining with eccentricity. Um, Andrew? Oh. Yeah. About the sort of the uh, interpretation of D prime, there are two questions. Yep. One is that uh, can we um, regard the D prime as uh, how much perceivable details there is in a given region of the visual field? Well, yeah, I mean, in these kinds of images, yeah, because this is, like I say, this is collapsing across many different filters. So yeah. if there's if there's a high response, it's not summing, you know, so I'm not like adding a bunch of D primes together. This is, I think this is probably a maximum across orientation, scale, and color. 
I see. Um, and also, yeah. 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 And another interpretation is that uh, similar to contrast measure, regardless of any detection criteria or performance, more or less. Uh, uh, D, D prime here, is yeah. it similar to contrast measure, uh, which is independent of the detection criterion or performance? So maybe basically, you know, it's the same kind of uh, interpretation. It's a, a perceivability in an yeah. ideal observer, observer. I don't know. I should look that up. Um, I don't know about that, though. It's, uh, I'd like to hear more about it. I had to dig kind of deep to find this. You know, Probably what, what, yeah, what yeah. Uh, uh, many people are confused is that when you talk about the deep line, then... Yeah probably we kind of associate what it translates into as a sort of a task. Yeah. So I think so that was probably a confusion. I, I know people are always, because most, when you do experiments and so on, you're, you're always encountering D primes in this range of one, two, three, four, and you associate it with a, like the staircase that you use or something like that. Um, so, but, in all these models of contrast sensitivity, especially of contrast discrimination, um, the models that explain, and this, I mean, this goes back a long time, the models that are used to explain contrast sensitivity and perceived contrast, contrast discrimination, contrast adaptation, and so on, they're always put in terms of a, um, a contrast response function that has this kind of sigmoid shape. Um, and, and that function can go up to very high, where basically on the y-axis you have a D prime of 20 or 30, um, which can seem weird at first if you're not familiar with this because that's, that's like an unmet, there is no task where you can measure a D prime of 20. Um, there's a, but there's also like a classic method for discovering that those levels actually exist, you know, basically Fechner's method of, um, yeah. I measure your sensitivity to something, and then I take that threshold value, I measure your increment sensitivity on top of that, I take that new level, and, and so on and so forth, and you keep summing those ratios, and that's how you get these response functions. Um, yeah, probably we can skip, uh, and then we can probably take this uh, figure as uh, um, for the moment, like, let's say if you see D prime above five, it means that, you know, it's totally clearly visible. That's yeah the point of this figure, right? Yeah. And it, it means that, yeah. So if you have a filter that's responding with uh, a, a value of five, you can also think of it as that means that that filter is, is almost certainly responding to actual contrast out there in the world, right? Um, whereas if you have a filter that's responding with a value of one, that's, that's pretty within the, the normal distribution here. You know, there's a good, right? And that's why you might have a false alarm for, you know, in that range. Um, but there's no false alarm that's going to, that's going to give you a D prime five, you know, maybe in a thousand trials, 2000 trials, you know, but and it would take a million years to get a false alarm in the level of a D prime of 10 or 20, you know, so. Okay. So there, there may be some kind of question about the D prime, but uh, let's uh, leave it until the end of this part of the talk. Okay. Yeah, cool. you, always get, you always get hung up on things you don't expect in these kinds of talks. All right. Um, anyway, yeah. So what what we do is we can we use this method to construct a visible image. This is this is basically a simulation of what a normal human observer should be able to see if if they're fixating over here on the left, um, and if this were all calibrated right, then this is the contrasts and colors and so on the observer would be able to see. Um, so what we're going to do is try to evaluate the colorfulness of this image. Um, I think a good way to do it is to suppose we have a spotlight of attention that we can direct out here. Um, and since we now have this in the form of a, of a RGB image, we can just extract sort of normal color statistics that everyone's already familiar with. So what we'll do is we'll pull out the saturation quantiles. So these kind of, I think, reflect the vividness of the colors that are there in that region. Um, and the distribution of hues. So this, this reflects uh, like the variegation, right? So you put these two together and you have a, a kind of a measure of, of, of how colorful this patch of the scene is, how vivid and variegated is the color information. Um, but we also need a sampling scheme. Um, 
and what I think is right to do is to use a scheme that respects um, the way uh, spatial attention scales with eccentricity. Um, I know this makes people suspicious. Um, and so the, this attentional window should get larger with increasing eccentricities. Yeah. And so you have a larger and larger sample size. And when you use this kind of sample to collect these color statistics, yeah, you find that the saturation distribution is pretty stable with eccentricity. Right, so the probability of having, so the solid lines here, I don't mind, yeah, the quantile labels haven't showed up for some reason there, but the very top line here, this is the 99th um, percentile saturation. Right, that's the highest saturations that are encountered um, across 100 natural scenes um, in the visible image transform. And you see that especially the high saturations are pretty stable with eccentricity. Um, the hue entropy is similar, right? So you have a similar kind of distribution of, of hue information near the fovea as you do in the far periphery. Yeah. Um, of course, people are suspicious of this sampling rule. There's like, uh, you're, you're like putting your, um, embedding the con conclusion there in the method, but you can do this differently. You can take a fixed size window. Um, this window size is, um, oh, I don't have the number in there. It's like, I think, like one and a half degrees radius. It's, if you put your arm out, put your hand out at arm's length and touch your finger, your forefinger and thumb together, you have a little window there and then just kind of sweep that out across your field of your, your visual field and you have a sampling rule like this. Um, I don't think that humans can actually do this. Uh, I, this I, visual attention doesn't work this way, but we can, we can do it just for the sake of argument. So when we sample this way, um, the color statistics now decline gradually with eccentricity, but there's no drastic decrease. And like the distribution of, of saturations and hues at 30 degrees is still pretty close to what it was foveally. But again, I don't think that any human observer can actually sample across their visual field like this, right? So if you're, if you're sitting there having a, 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 an experience of a visual scene and you're just you know, evaluating for yourself how colorful is it, um, if you're checking something out in the periphery, you're going to use a larger attentional window. That's just the way it is. So, okay, so that's color. Um, now edge content or uh, sharpness or detailedness. Um, I, maybe I should stick on this image for a second, you know, and of course, when you look at this, you look out here and you say, oh, it's, it's very blurry. There's much less detail and so on. But if you do that, it's, it's a mistake, right? Because you're foveating this. Right? You can't foveate your periphery. The periphery is what it is. It feels the way it feels. Um, you don't have some sort of internal central fovea that's very fine resolution that you could point at your peripheral vision and discover that it, that it has a lower resolution. That doesn't make sense. Um, so we have to like evaluate this thing on its own terms. Um, this is a bit harder to do because, you know, there's no, with, with color, you have like the hue saturation, um, value representation of color that everybody's kind of familiar with, but there's no such thing for, for edge content. Um, there's various kinds of edge filters and so on that we could use, but we, we need one here that works with the model. So what I like to do is use, there's a couple of ideas, a couple of things I try in the paper, but this is, I think, the easier one to explain. Um, this comes from scale space theory. I think there's a good reference for this, this way of modeling blur perception um, down here at the bottom, this paper by Mark Georgeson. Um, but what this plot here is showing is a, a sharp feature, a high resolution edge. So on the x-axis, you have spatial position. Um, and on the y-axis, and, and this is just like one dimensional. So at some position on our spatial axis, there's a feature, it's an edge. Um, and this feature has a certain resolution. It has a very high resolution. It extends it to, into a very fine scale. That's why the line goes up like this. And so that feature exists there in an image somewhere. Um, and what you're doing when you look at it is you're, you're laying out uh, a set of your visual filters um, on that feature to try to, to collect that information. Um, and your foveal filters, they're, they have a pretty fine scale, right? I have four of them represented here. Um, and the idea is that if all of those filters or if all of the filters of the appropriate orientation and color and so on, um, if they're responding across scale, 
then you have a complete response. And that's the, that's the, the, the model equivalent, the model correlate of sharpness, right? So that, that's what it is for an edge to appear sharp, is that all of the appropriate filters at the right phase and orientation and so on, they're all responding vigorously, right? That's a sharp feature. Um, so if we take a low resolution edge, you see this one doesn't extend to such fine scales. Um, it's at the same spatial position. And we direct our foveal filters there. You see that the two finest, the two smallest filters are not responding. So this is an incomplete response. The signal drops off at the high frequency um, uh, filters. And this is what it is for something to appear blurry, is that you have some low frequency mechanisms are responding, but the expected response from the high frequency mechanisms isn't there, right? So that's what's, that's what's happening when something appears blurry. Um, now we can go to the uh, peripheral situation where we have this same feature, this the same uh, high resolution edge, but now we're gonna expose four um, coarser filters to it. So these are our, our peripheral visual filters. They're all a bit larger. Um, they also register this thing as sharp, right? Because here, all four of them are going off. They're all ex responding in the expected way. And so the observer would say, yeah, I see a sharp feature there. But now they're going to say the same thing for the low resolution edge. Because again, this low resolution edge, um, it has all the expected content from the point of view of these larger peripheral filters. Okay, so now we have a kind of a this might seem complicated, but I think this is about as simple of a definition of blur and sharpness that you can get that still kind of respects, you know, some psychophysical data um, having to do with how we actually perceive blur. Um, so from this, we can then construct a little metric for scale completeness in our model, right? So at every point in the model, if you have, if all of your filters at a certain orientation, um, are responding with a very high d prime value, which we convert into this accuracy thing and take the pro product. So if this product is close to one, we say, ah, there's a, there's a sharp edge there, right? There's a, there's a, high, there's a feature, um, a, complete, a scale complete feature. Um, if we do that for the model, then we find, ah, it does. It actually picks up um, filters of, uh, it picks out features in the periphery, it picks out features near the fovea, um, and these things that to your eye look blurry for the model, these are sharp in exactly the same way as the foveal features are. Um, so if we take this kind of definition of blur, again, apply it to our big sample of natural scenes of the, the, um, the model responses to all these natural scenes, um, then you find that, well, the, the probability of having a sharp feature at any position in the visual field is basically independent of eccentricity. Um, and this doesn't depend on um, this, this measure doesn't depend at all on the sampling rule, right? Because um, this is just an average. This is uh, an average of the, uh, uh, what, it's the probability of seeing a feature out here. So it doesn't matter how big the sampling window is. Um, so this is, okay, I've finally gotten to the interim. Yeah, this is because we were taking questions during the first half and so it slowed us down. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, we oh. uh, you know, planned up to like, you know, 10, 15 for this part. So. No problem. Okay. Yeah. So we're basically done with the first half. I'll just recap the the conclusions, which are that your visual responses underlying color percepts and sharpness percepts are pretty similar across the visual field. I mean, the main difference. I mean, there are other differences. There's crowding and so on. Um, there's other differences between foveal and peripheral vision. But when it comes to spatial vision, the main difference is just of scale. Right. Your sensitivity is coarser in the periphery. Um, yeah, so, so why is it? Why do you have this stable representation across the visual field? The first one is like what I just said, but I'm going to show it to you in a little more detail here. Um, peripheral, and contra peripheral and foveal contrast representations mainly differ in scale, not in sensitivity. So despite the fact that you see these, so on the y-axis here we have contrast sensitivity, um, x-axis we have eccentricity. So for a certain spatial frequency, which is one of these lines, yeah, it's true, your sensitivity drops with eccentricity. But you can turn that around and think, well, I have a certain sensitivity in the fovea. I have a contrast sensitivity of 30, say. And if you move out into the periphery, you still have that same sensitivity. You still have it for 100. Even I mean, the top line here, there should be more lines going up. Um, like I said, if the model had large enough filters, um, 
So this, this whole model is kind of two band paths, that's the problem, one problem with it. Um, but really, when you look at things that way, you have the same sensitivity in, at, in peripheral vision as you have in the phobia, more or less. The main difference is just in scale. And when you combine that with the fact that natural scene content is scale invariant, right? So contrast is distributed similarly at all spatial frequencies in natural scenes, this one over F property. You put these two things together, and yeah, of course, the statistics of your, the, the, your, the way the visual system represents contrast which includes things like detail and sharpness and color and brightness and darkness and so on. It's going to be very similar across the whole visual field. So I think an observer is perfectly justified in making claims like that they see a sharp, colorful um, scene before them across the entire visual field. Yeah, so do we pause? Yeah, pause. Let's pause. Uh, can you go back to that uh, conclusion slide? Yeah. So uh, we'll take some questions uh, until 10.50. Uh, first, uh, Shim Shimojo asked you, can you generate a stimulus which uh, vary, uh, which very selectively activate only few channels in your model? And then in that case, the average response remains weak, but the subjective yeah. quality may be very clear. Uh, yeah, let's say a single isolated yeah. Gabor. Yeah, exactly. Like that's that's what a, a Gabor is designed to do. Is to um, that's what I was showing in the earlier slides, where you just have a black field. The response image is this black field with a hot spot in the middle. That hot spot is mostly coming from the achromatic channels that are tuned to the right frequency and scale, uh, uh, frequency and orientation. And most of the other filters are silent. Yeah. So yeah, okay. that's what Shame. spatial vision really all spatial vision psychophysics is really all about. Yeah, Shin, if you wanted to uh, elaborate question, that's fine uh, to do right now. Uh, oh. Can you, yeah, all right. You see me? Yes, in uh, karate, I don't know <laughs> where? Um, which camera? I'm not sure, but, okay, so that's fine. But then that means that the uh, quality, the quality, uh, the quality of the um, vision has location tag. That's what mm. inevitably what you're saying. Is that okay? Wait, what do you mean? Well, you know, so let's say isolated Gabor patch in one particular eccentricity in one particular location and nothing else. It's all like my subjective feeling is that it's a very clear Gabor patch, but I know mm. where it is. And it's not like average uh, response from all my filters uh, across locations. So that's what's yeah, happening. So, yeah, I mean, this, my, that's kind of what I'm going to talk about maybe in the last part of the talk is where this feeling of spatial orderedness comes from. You know, the fact that you feel a thing in a particular place. I mean, okay. that information is all there in the model. So I'm not doing any, I'm not like summing across. I don't want to waste up all the time, but I have just one brief question. Mm -hmm. Why isn't it the case that conscious visual experience is exactly following the blurry uh, quality or you know, low signal to noise in color in the periphery. Because if it's the limitation for performance, mm. then consciousness can be evolutionarily adapted to reflect peacefully that you know, optical quality or performance quality. Why our consciousness betrays our performance in the periphery? Do you understand? Okay. Because your model is trying to explain the dis mm. discrepancy, but you didn't explain why there's a discrepancy. I don't think there is a discrepancy. I don't think, I think if you have the feeling like from your conscious experience of looking at a scene or a stimulus or something that you see something clearly, you there do is see a discrepancy it. in performance because if you do vernier acuity test mm -hmm. or finger to finger, you know, tapping onto each other in the extreme periphery, then you get lots of mistakes. Mm -hmm. So it's not the same as phobia in performance. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, Okay, at some point this thing will break down. I mean, once you start encountering um, situations where contrast sensitivity is not enough to explain performance anymore, then yeah, it'll break down. And I don't, I don't have the answer, but I think this is the question to ask. In the periphery, why our consciousness betrays our behavioral psychophysical performance? I don't have an answer, so I'll stop, but you know, just want to raise. Maybe we can um, come back to that issue, um, especially the second part also relates to this you know, qualia mm. of the space and so on. 
Okay. I need to think more about that. Sure. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the second part, which is more to do with the IIT and some of the audience may be also more interested in this part. Please yeah, go ahead. And in my mind, these are like two sides of the same coin, but there's very, very different material. Yeah, so, um, so what I just spent all that time talking about was the kind of stuff that you can experience across the visual field. Um, or what we think you can experience across the visual field based on what we know about contrast sensitivity, right? So you can experience um, colors and details and so on. But the bigger question is what is the visual field in the first place, right? So what is the visual field? Um, I can say it's a spatial experience. Um, the visual field is this spatial structure that is extended out in front of you. Um, I would argue that it's two dimensional. Uh, it's, it's not quite that simple, but it's this two dimensional field that's extended in front of you. Um, and it has very stable properties, but what you see, what's embedded within it and what you extract from it varies a lot from moment to moment. Um, so what do we mean by a spatial experience? Um, what I'm going to do here is a very, very reduced phenomenology of uh, spatial experience. So a spatial experience or a visual field is one that is composed of spots. I've drawn a spot right here. I've drawn this circle and this uh, reproduction of a visual field. For any spot in your visual field, you can always find some other spot that is connected to it, right? So any spot is connected to others, meaning that you can always find some other spot that partially overlaps it and where that partial overlap is itself another spot. So I could always have just picked this spot and done the exercise from there, right? Um, so intersections of spots exist also as spots. You can think of it that way. Um, and then we can invert it and say that, well, whenever you have two connected spots, they always fuse into larger spots, right? So, you know, I can, we can look at these two overlapping spots, but it's also true that this shape that I've outlined is another spot. It's another patch within the visual field. Um, and it has all this, it's also connected to other spots and so on. And then finally, any spot that I choose includes other smaller spots down to a limit, down to the finest grain of points or whatever. And it's included by other spots, other larger spots. Um, and this doesn't depend on there being any particular thing that you're experiencing, right? So you could be looking at this scene or maybe I just take the scene away. Now I have a blank screen. You could close your eyes and I think that this would all still be true. Um, the visual field is composed of spots. Any spot is connected to other spots. Um, I say any spot, you know, you can imagine that the visual field as a whole is one big spot. It's not connected to anything, but that's again, another limit. That's an upper limit. Um, anytime you have overlapping spots, the overlap between them is itself another spot. Um, connected spots are fused into larger spots. And spots include and in are included by other spots. Yeah. So this is, this is really what we mean when we say that something like the visual field is a spatial experience, right? It has these properties. And it can be shown that if something has these properties, then it's gonna be ordered in the right ways for us to call it a space. You can then assess its, its dimensionality, right? So you can say, oh, I have a one dimensional space. Any segment of a line, for example, is gonna follow these properties, right? If I take a 2D space, and take patches out of it, they're gonna obey these same properties. Um, so what is a spatial experience? Um, what is it really? Um, this is where we go to integrated information theory. Um, so what, uh, I, I know you guys have gone over this a couple of weeks ago, so I'm not gonna do like a, an, an IIT tutorial here. I'll just kind of remind you that IIT starts from a, a very reduced phenomenology of experience uh, in total. It says that any conscious experience is intrinsic. It's compositional, meaning it's composed of many parts put together. Um, it's integrated, so it's a whole. It's more than the sum of its parts. It's informative, which means that it's specific. Um, it's precisely the way that it is. And it's exclusive, which means that it's bounded. It has a boundary. And what this translates into for physical systems, and I have it combined here just in one big sentence, is that a conscious experience is the maximally irreducible intrinsic cause-effect structure of a physical system. 
you know? So this is taking all five postulates that correspond to these and wrapping it up in one statement. So I'm gonna keep using this statement here. Um, so now we'll ask a more specific version of this question. So a spatial conscious experience is the maximally irreducible intrinsic cause effect structure of what kind of physical system? So what kind of system might produce an experience that has all these properties that we call the properties of spatial experience? All right, I'm going to give away the answer right away and say that our, what we argue is that a spatial experience is the maximally irreducible intrinsic cause effect structure of a grid network, right? That when you have a grid network, especially the right kind of grid network, it's going to specify a kind of experience that um, basically is, is identical to what we call a spatial experience, which means, which I think means that all of your spatial experiences are being specified by grid networks. So why do we say this? Um, well, this network that I've drawn in this oval here is from, I, from the computational IT perspective, it's monstrous. I could never compute its cause effect structure. Um, but I can take a little piece of the network, which I've drawn here. Um, we'll zoom in on that little line grid that was embedded in the hex grid. And we'll unfold the cause effect structure of this little tiny grid network. Um, I'm not going to talk about like what's the rule that these nodes, they're basically little integrators. They pool their inputs and they either turn on or they stay off. Um, it doesn't have very interesting behavior. Um, now, so step one in this unfolding is to figure out what parts of the grid actually exist for the grid. So how does it exist for itself? What is its cause effect structure? What are the parts of the cause effect structure? Um, so we'll do an example here. Um, let's take the units CDE. So I have this represented over here as we call it a mechanism. So CDE is a set of units. Um, right now they're all off, they're resting. Um, and we're going to evaluate, does CDE have a, a, an irreducible cause on the system? It turns out that it does. The maximally irreducible cause for this mechanism is CDE being all off. Um, so yeah, it's the same. So the, the cause of CDE is basically the same as CDE itself. It causes itself to be in the state that it's in. Um, the effect is very similar. So the maximally irreducible effect of CDE being off is that CDE will be off. So it's very, very boring, right? So these, the same kind of thing is true. And I, maybe I should say here that if you've, if you've gone over like the 3.0 formalism recently, this, this sounds a little different. Um, we're not, I'm not showing repertoires or whatever. What I'm showing is a particular state from within the repertoire. I mean, that's not, going to be important here, but I just want to acknowledge that that's a, a difference that some of you might notice. Um, so if a mechanism has these properties, if it has a, an irreducible cause and an irreducible effect, we say that it's a concept or a causal distinction within the system. And it turns out that for a grid network, whenever you pick some connected units, like say C, I'll just take C alone because it has a self-connection. It turns out that C's cause and effect within the system are on itself. DEF has a cause and an effect on itself in the system. Um, I can pick a little slightly weird one here, CDFG, so I skipped a unit. But the cause and the effect of this mechanism are similar to one another and they kind of fill in the gap in this case. Um, can take the, the grid as a whole. The grid as a whole has an irreducible cause on itself and an irreducible effect on itself. This is very straightforward. And this is kind of a general rule that for grid networks, if you take a contiguous patch out of the network, that patch is going to exist intrinsically as a concept or a causal distinction. Um, and grid concepts will usually have this very strong cause effect symmetry. You, you can break it by changing the state of the mechanism or by changing the rule that the units follow. But for the most part, that's kind of the characteristic of a grid is it has this very um, un kind of uninteresting structure where the causes and the effects are all very similar to the mechanism. Um, but it also makes it kind of easier to understand because it means that if you pick out a patch of your network, that patch is basically intrinsically a piece of the network. 
but but not this so the, sorry symmetry here means the symmetry with respect to the time right yeah so the cause and the effect tend to be very similar for this kind of network it's it's self-directed it's not um a, a network that is that is directed or oriented then you'll have mechanisms where the causes and the effects are very different right so it'll be asymmetric in that sense but so the, really, this yeah okay so this symmetry comes from the fact that the connectivity is pretty much symmetric yeah it's very symmetric that's that's what we qualify as a grid a grid is a network yeah. that has this kind of regular symmetry as you go from unit to unit they're all connected to their neighbors in the same way all connections are reciprocal and so on. Um, and when you have that you have this very predictable kind of structure to the concepts um, and so maybe so I'm not going over like tests of irreducibility and so on, but you know, it's not true that every patch exists as a concept. So we can pick the units BH, for example. BH is reducible, right? It has a five zero. So BH does not exist for the system. There is no distinction BH, right? There is no BEFGH either. These are reducible. So the ones that exist are the connected ones. So if you have a connected patch out of a grid, that patch is going to exist as a concept. Right. So those are the parts that you get when you unfold a grid network. Um, so then the question is, how do those parts exist for the grid? Um, and now we bring in relations um, because we have the parts, but the parts of an experience relate to one another and the relations are themselves a part of the experience. Right. Otherwise, it would just be a bag of unrelated parts. Um, so let's take our example distinction CDE. We'll pick another one, D, E, F, all right? They're very similar. And you can see that they overlap on the units D, E. They both constrain the units D, E. And what we find is that that relation, that overlap between the two distinctions actually exists for the system. It's maximally irreducible. It has a phi value. Um, and I've, this is actually a compound relation. So the causes and the effects all overlap with one another in this case. You could also have relations where one concept's effect overlaps another concept's cause. That would be very different. So um, in the grid, the relations are always like this. They're, the relations are also very symmetric. Causes and effects all overlap together in one big knot. Um, I can pick another distinction out here, DE. And we find that, okay, CDE relates to DE and DEF does as well. They all overlap on these same units. Um, and there's also a third order relation between these three. So all three of these concepts are, they're bound together by having this third order relation in addition to the second order relations. Um, and I mean, the binding is just in virtue of the fact that they are constraining the same elements in the network. Um, and now I'll just go right to the, um, the crucial thing here, which is that this, this situation here between CDE, DEF, and DE is topologically the same as what I described as spatial connection earlier, where I have one thing that overlaps another thing, and the overlap between them is itself also another thing within the system. We we'll call this connection. So CDE is connected to DEF. Of course, this situation with CDE and DEF is like, it's, it's infinitesimal. You have these, little, these two little tiny line segments, basically. Whereas my two spots here are big and round and two dimensional. So it's, they're, they're bigger, they have a different shape, um, but structurally it's the same situation. Um, and we can uh, show the opposite thing as well. So CDE and DEF overlap one another. Um, there's also another um, concept out there, CDEF, that overlaps both of these guys um, on all of the same units that they um, independently overlap on. And there's a third order relation there. So these three guys are also bound together in a special relation. Um, and so this situation is, is structurally the same as spatial fusion. So I have two things that overlap, right? But the union of the two of them is also a thing that exists in the system. Um, and it turns out that most of the concepts that are specified by a grid network relate to the rest of the structure in these ways. All right, so I can kind of build this thing up here. I'm going to array the concepts on, um, on an X and a Y coordinate. It doesn't really matter. What, it's just for aesthetic purposes. But 
So here we have CDE. I'll place it here. CDE, I color it gold because it's connected to other distinctions. It's fused with other distinctions. It's included by and it includes other distinctions or concepts. The same is true for DEF. So DEF is connected to other concepts. It fuses with other concepts. It includes as an included by and so on. Same is true for CDEF. There are other guys out there that CDEF connects to, that it fuses with. And if we look at all of the concepts that come out of this, this little network, we find that most of them follow all, obey this pattern. So most of the concepts in this, um, that come out of this network are connected and fused and included. Um, there's two big exceptions. There's the exceptions at the top. So there's a, there's a little family of concepts that have a cause and an effect over the entire network, right? So it's kind of like a top spot. It can't connect to anyone else and it can't fuse to anyone else, but it is the fusion of many other concepts. And then down at the bottom, you have points basically. Um, and then you have these guys which connect to one another, like AB connects to BC and BC connects to CD, but neither of them is the, none of them are the fusion of anything. You could say that CD is the fusion of C and D, but strictly that's not true. You see for the most part, this is a, and then there are kind of weird things that show up, B, C, D, E, F. Yeah. So there is some strangeness in there. Um, this kind of result is not um, a foregone conclusion. It's actually hard to get. Um, so most kinds of networks that you look at will not have a structure like this. Um, if it has any kind of directedness, if you have different rules for the different mechanisms, you will not get a structure like this. Um, so basically, if you have an asymmetric network, you might get something that's, you know, that has a big phi value, and you'll get lots and lots of concepts, but the causes and effects will be disjoint, and you won't get these spatial properties. Um, and while I've, you know, I've focused on a one-dimensional example, basically, because it's, I can compute the whole thing and investigate it, um, these same things seem to hold true for a 2D grid. So I take a hex grid like this and zoom in on a little piece of it. Um, the concepts have this same stereotypical structure where that the mechanism is colored in pink here. Um, so A, B, C, E, F, I, J has a cause over the same units and an effect over the same units. It has the same kind of symmetry. Um, same for this mechanism. This one is maybe kind of funny. You know, F, I has a cause over, you see F and I are separated like this. They have a cause over the in-between units and an effect over the same units. And then if you assess all of the um, concepts that come out of this little piece of the 2D grid for their spatial properties, you find that, well, they all meet this definition, all right? So they all connect to one another, they fuse into one another and so on. So I think we have good, we have pretty good reason to believe that, um, and we've looked at this for all kinds of different variations on these grid networks. And it seems to be kind of a general fact that grid networks will specify these structures that have all of the same basic properties as what we recognize as a spatial experience. Um, the problem is that, you know, these networks that I've been playing around with and that I've focused on here, they're all these simple, they're, they're grids of these simple binary nodes that are either on or off. So it doesn't seem like there's any room there for, so they, a network like this might well specify a big 2D space a 2, 2D spatial experience, but there's no reason to think that that's gonna feel anything like this. You know, it has color and structure and surfaces and textures and so on in it. Where can that stuff come from? Um, so here's an idea. I mean, I think I've, I've been working on this. I don't have like, I'm nowhere near having like actual computed results to show, but I think that something like this is true. That what's specifying the visual field is a complex grid. Um, I've drawn a little hex grid here. So let's zoom in on some of these units. I call it a complex grid because every node in this grid is not a single unit, right? There's actually many elements that constitute each node. And those elements are a little subnetwork, right? So the little subnets here are reduplicated from node to node and the lateral connections are actually complex. It's like actually a bundle of connections. But that pattern of connectivity is reduplicated over and over again, a 2D grid here. And importantly, the subnet is not itself a grid 
right? It has a very asymmetric internal connectivity. It's directed, the different nodes follow different rules and so on. So what, what, I, what we think this is gonna correspond to is a spatial structure, right? So the, at the level at which you look at this thing as a grid, it's specifying a big spatial structure that where all of the high order concepts connect to one another and fuse to one another and so on. But then when you look at the, the lowest order of concepts, they're not, they're not just points anymore. They're gonna have further substructure that's specified by the units of these subnets, um, right? So you have a spatial structure where every point has some further structure that is not spatial, right? So the prediction is that this kind of network is going to specify a spatial experience that is composed of non-spatial structure at each point. I've drawn that here as you know, kind of implying that, well, that's quite like a, a space with colored points. Um, so then we can go further out and ask, well, if this is the case, if this is where the visual field comes from, what's a candidate for um, this little subnet? What are the nodes of the visual field grid? Um, based on the kind of thing that I talked about in the first half of the talk, I tend to think that you could explain quite a lot of the local qualities of the visual field just by looking at the high, like hyper columns in early visual cortex, All right? V1 maybe might do quite a lot of the work. Um, so if you have a big node of, of, of uh, these complex, if you have a big grid of nodes that have this, these subnetworks that are encoding all of these different aspects of contrast structure, um, where you put in a different stimulus and kick that subnet into a different state, one of a huge number of possible different states, then the substructures that you, the substructures that you get in the cause effect structure might be something like colors or maybe feeling of stereoscopy or motion or who knows what else. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, this is a big open question that I don't know how to simulate and I don't really know how to even um, address this question for the time being, but it's a big question for me. So like, what is the, the grid that's specifying the visual field? Um, because it does seem that early visual cortex is a grid of these complex nodes. Um, and that's what we think is the case, is that the visual field is what it's like to be early visual cortex. But it feels like more than that, because we still have that cartoon that I showed earlier. The visual field isn't all of visual experience. It's, it's tied into all of these higher properties, recognitional properties, um, segmentation, and so on. And so that might be the way the spatial experience relates to the cause effect structure being specified by everything else downstream. You know? Um, and there's one last thing, which is, you know, anyone who knows about cortical magnification would think, well, why should it look like this? Why should the space be like this? It should actually be distorted. Um, this is something I think about a lot because it, it, I don't know if it's distorted. It might actually be that your, perif your visual periphery is compressed, that it's smaller than it seems, you know, and now I'm the one saying that there's an illusion, but that's something that's been um, measured in various ways over the years. Helmholtz um, described it. There's a, an illusion you can look up the Helmholtz grid that suggests that something like this might actually be happening, that the peripheral visual field is actually smaller per visual angle um, than you would think that it is. And that would fit with the idea that the visual field is a structure being specified by early visual cortex, which has this strong cortical magnification thing going on. Okay, so we've come to our conclusion um, just to remind you of the earlier stuff, the color contrast edge content in the visual field is more or less what it seems. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of other stuff going on that isn't captured by contrast sensitivity and so on. There's crowding and attentional effects and feedback from like what you're recognizing the scene as and so on. There's probably more. Um, but I think it's largely as it seems. And we're not subject to some crazy illusion about the qualities of um, uh, experience across the visual field. Um, and I'll just say that the visual field is a spatial structure and grid networks feel like spatial structures. And that leaves a big open question that I've tried to give a suggestion to here, which is what is the grid specifying visual experience? So that's it. Um, now we can talk about this if everyone's still there. Yes, uh, they are still. You haven't actually lost much 
uh, audience, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. And the audience, <laughs> please uh, applaud him. Uh, it was a very clear yeah. presentation. Uh, so uh, if there is any uh, questions uh, that you want to ask right now before we turn off the uh, recording, uh, you can do so by speaking directly or uh, type it in the uh, chat and then I direct you. Maybe before other people start asking them, one, one question I have is that uh, uh, when, when we add the sub, sub unit network, like let's say color component, a motion network or something like that into yeah. this, you know, a particular patch of the points, then what, what kind of mechanism or IAT structure can uh, prohibit uh, the situation where that particular part of the visual field gets magnified, you know, artificially. Mm. I mean, as, as we add more units which are connected, IIT would predict that, you know, that part of the concept becomes larger and larger and larger. And then the inclusion and also uh, fusion and, you know, connection all becomes probably continued to be, you know, growing. So if I take this, you know, inclusion, connection, and fusion per C as the direct phenomenological correlates of the space, then that, you know, what, in, in other words, uh, what actually distinguishes this spaceness from different types of the, uh, uh, in, um, I don't know, uh, IAT structures locally attached to yes. this point? Well, I mean, you can, you can imagine that, I, I think the way I present this, it almost seems inevitable, you know. Um, but what makes these things spatial relations is a very specific um, set of overlaps that you have. That, so CDE, it's cause and it's effect. For one thing, it overlaps on itself. That's kind of similar to the reflexivity of what you recognize as a piece of space. You know, spots in a space overlap on themselves. Um, trivially, I think. Um, and, they, and these distinctions, these concepts, they overlap one another on their causes and on their effects in the same way. Um, and this kind of symmetry is really hard to get. And for the most part, if you start patching other stuff into this network, or if you take the, the, the nodes and you break them out into more complicated little subnetworks, most of the structure that you see will not obey these rules. Right? You'll have all kinds of situations where causes overlap with effects, where you have lots of overlap of causes, but no overlap of effects, and a huge number of other possible things that can go on. And so what, what I would look for in, in, a, a, in something like this, to try to model this, and you can imagine you need a big network to try to model this situation, and that's the difficulty. Um, is it should be that, that the spatial structure is very stable, right? And it doesn't really matter. So it could be that down here in R or Q, if it's visible, you might have different numbers of units down there, although that might violate the symmetry somehow. Um, but what matters is that this, the part of the structure that is spatial stays the same, right? So if you're varying the state, or the way other parts of the network are connected to the grid, it shouldn't vary the space, the spaceness of it. Okay, so maybe you know one quick uh, prediction would be like uh, if the area of the brain that are sort of the basis of the space experience, you would predict that the connectivity would be symmetric, so that it uh, achieves all these you know grid uh, type uh, phenomenology. Whereas uh, if the uh, area is more to do with the quality of the color or motion or something like that, then it should predict that there is some kind of asymmetric uh, connectivity that breaks or does not achieve this type of spatial experience. Yeah, yeah. So okay. parts of that's part of the experience that's yeah, testable. Great. And then, uh, okay, uh, there was a question from Felix. Uh, Felix, do you want to speak or should I represent your question? 
Um, I'm happy to ask it out loud, I guess. Um, thanks for a yeah, really interesting talk. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't work on IIT, but I do, I have read quite a lot of IIT related stuff, um, but I maybe understand, uh, misunderstanding things anyway. So I'm wondering um, if I have a, if, I mean, there are experiences we have, which are somehow we consider, or we, we experience things in the visual th field that we might consider as single objects, but which are spatially disjoint. So I was thinking of the example of um, if I'm in, uh, on a, on a starless night, uh, if I see a car approaching in the distance, I'll see the headlight, headlights um, moving together, but I would consider them to be a single object in some, yeah. in some sense. Um, is that kind of, and, and even if I'd never seen a car before, um, the kind of symmetric motion would kind of, lead, would presumably lead me to conclude that they were a single object. Is that, is that something that could be explained using this model? No. I mean, for that, you need some kind of recognitional capacity, I think, to, to do like a modal completion or something. So where you see a complete object, even if all of the features, to see any object, even if I show you like a solid, if you see the whole car at the same time, you know, and it's not even a matter of headlights in the dark, none of this explains why you see it as an object bound together in a foreground against a background and so on. For that, you need these, you need higher levels that are connected to the, to the grid, um, but their job is to detect things or to organize the input. Um, and that's kind of what this is supposed to be. This is a cartoon, of course, but the idea is that here at the bottom, you have a grid that is specifying just the purely spatial aspect of the experience. And then at some higher layers, you have units that through the way they connect down to the grid, if those units are active in the right way, they basically bind together a patch of the space and segment it out. And meanwhile, they're also connected to other things that so you can now talk about, I see a car or whatever. Um, but that kind of process doesn't, rec doesn't require that there's actually a, you know, a clearly drawn connected pattern there in the grid. It just requires that the recognitional stuff is going off in the right way. Um, so I think that it's those, those kinds of things are, are compatible with this account, but they're not, they're not explained by this account, right? So you need more machinery. You need like recognition machinery um, to do that stuff. Okay, thanks. That, that clears it up a lot, yeah. Okay, then there was a question from Ariel. Ariel, do you want Hi, to speak? Thanks. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Thanks for the, the great talk. I'm wondering how you expect this to correspond to other areas of experience that have um, dimensionality and arguably some sort of spatial structure. So something like audition, where you've got like amplitude and pitch, um, as opposed to something like somatic sensation, where you've got location like you do with a spatial field, but like other senses as well. Like, I presume you would predict that somatic sensation would have the same sort of grid in the somatosensory cortex, but I'm not sure what this would predict for something like auditory experiences where they're sort of spatial, but not, I'm, I'm unclear. Yeah, you have, I, with, yeah, with like tactile experiences or other kind of somesthetic experiences, there, there it's easier to, I feel like if I reach under my chair for something, I have a feeling of where my hand is that I would, I think it's spatial, but at least for me at least, it's a lot harder for me to like grasp that kind of structure. So I, yeah, I think that this would predict that, that like your some aesthetic experiences are spatial and that then the local qualities that you experience within that space are things like pressure or pain and so on. Um, although it's less clear to me, vision is very clear. It's, it's like, it's, your visual spatial attention seems to be organized so that you can just explore this spatial structure and, and make it very, very clear to yourself. But your some aesthetic, uh, like uh, tactile senses, you don't seem to have the same tools for introspecting it, or at least I don't. But yeah, this would say that those should be spatial experiences as well. And audition, I don't know, like, like yeah, you have tone maps and auditory cortex that you might say are, are organized in a grid-like way. Um, so does that mean that sound experiences have, uh, uh, like something like a one dimensional 
maybe like a helical kind of a spatial structure. And that's just the way they sound. I don't know. But then that would also mean for you to discover that it has that structure, you would need to be able to introspectively attend to different parts of the tone map while you're hearing like a broadband sound. And I don't know if we can do that. I don't know if you can actually, if we had, I don't know if there's a good analog to spatial attention when it comes to um, like auditory experiences. But you know what I'm saying? Um, Cause that's a big part of this. Like if you look at the paper, I haven't brought, brought it up at all here, but it's a big question. It's like, how are we able to discover that vision has this kind of experience? You know, you're able to do an exercise like this, what you're basically doing is you're shifting your spotlight attention around. And it seems to be organized in such a way that it allows you to discover that your experience has this structure. But other modalities, you may not have the same capacity for, for exploring their structure. And they might still have that structure anyways. That's, that's the thing that people can argue about is that if you can't tell that some experience has a certain structure, is it okay to believe that it does have that structure regardless of what you can discover about it. So IIT would say that yes, it has this kind of structure whether or not you know it. Um, that might be kind of controversial, I think. That makes sense, thanks. Okay, then maybe we'll wrap it up with the recording uh, with a final question from Yota. Uh, do you wanna speak? Uh, yes, uh, thanks for your talk, Andrew. Uh, my question is, what's the definition of spots in the space? Mm -hmm. um, because IT says that there's an identity between uh, distinctions in experience and distinctions in cause effect structure. Yeah. And in this case, so the spot can be considered as a distinctions in experience. Yep. So if we can take um, this, this distinctions of any size anywhere, it means that there should be the infinite number of spots. So it's a very large number. I it's it's I think that it's yeah it's implicit in this little demonstration, these two slides, that a spot is contiguous. It's it's a single part of the space. If I were to draw two two lines that don't overlap, now I have two spots that don't overlap. All right, that's definitely two things. Um, but now in a sense, there's one thing, there's one, I, that's not a very good way of illustrating it, I'm sorry, but, um, so yeah, that, that is, I think, implicit in this, this, this exercise here, that spots are singular connected things in the sense in which they're spatial. Um, and so yeah, every spot corresponds to, or at least it's, I can say every spot corresponds to a particular concept or distinction. So you have phenomenal distinctions and causal distinctions. It, it gets a little more complicated than that, but uh, um, yeah, that's the mapping that, that you should be making. Yeah. yeah but probably what the author wants to ask is uh, if that is a sort of definition of a spot, mm. then shouldn't there be almost like infinite number of the spots? Oh yeah. In our visual field. <laughs> And that doesn't <laughs> correspond to the number of the neurons in the brain. Yeah, yeah. The, number, the number of spots in the visual field, I would think, would way exceed the number of neurons you have in V1, say. It's a huge, huge, huge numbers. Um, I don't know about the whole brain, but yeah, maybe. Because we're talking about combinatoric, combinatorics here, right? So you have, not only do you have a spot given by this neuron, but you have a spot given by this neuron and its neighbors and by those neurons and their neighbors and so on. Um, so yeah, the, these, and then you bring in the relations, the fact that the relations also exist between these things, the fact that one spot is included by another one, that inclusion is itself something that exists there in the system and the numbers just become tremendous. It's, it's embarrassing to talk about how big the numbers are. It probably means it's the wrong way to think of it, trying to count these things, but yeah, the numbers get really big. Is that bad? Does that seem like a bad thing or a, a great thing? I don't know, Yota? Yeah, thanks, yeah. No. Probably we need to compute the, uh, like, discriminable, you know, the distinction, distinct, minimum distance between the spots or 
whether that actually matches with the estimated number of the neurons per area and then see if the minimum spot that we are assuming phenomenologically corresponds to the minimum um, cause effect structure that this you know connected type of the grid can sustain kind of calculation mm -hmm. right probably yeah i would you think know. i mean i've done it before like how if you wanted to estimate you could do it based on like the acuity um like known visual acuity across the visual field you could estimate like the total number of discriminable points in the visual field and that number gets up like in the millions i think mm. um, but then that's just the points. And so those points, why do they feel like they're ordered in the particular way that they are? You know, why are all of the just discriminable points in your visual field, why are they in that fixed order? And it's because there's all these higher order concepts that are including them and binding them together in that particular pattern. They're being set in order. And that part of the structure is just immense. It's, if you have a million points, then you have, I don't know, trillions of trillions of higher order spots that are keeping those points in the order that you experience them in. Yeah. But it's, okay. not, it's, it's not any kind of work that the brain has. That's just the way the thing is. That's just the way that it exists. It's not like that's information you have to compute or it's not work you have to do. So in that sense, it's, it's okay. It doesn't imply that you have infinite capacity for processing information or something like that. Okay, uh, that's great. Uh, so let's thank Andrew again, and uh, we'll uh, finish the recording at this point, and then you can uh, you feel you know free to leave. Uh, and if there's any anyone who wants to uh, stay here to ask questions, uh, that's totally fine. And from here on, we'll not record. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Sure. Thank you.